Welcome to Real Estate Today. I'm Elliot Kulik, and today is going to be a different type of show. We're going to be talking about real estate law, but we're not just going to sit in an office with an attorney and just kind of talk about it. What we're going to do is we're going to have fictional reenactments of some common scenarios that happen that maybe has happened to you, you know, in, in your own buying and selling of real estate. We're lucky to have Larry Fetter. He's been in the real estate business and he's been an attorney for over 30 years. He owns a company called Tri-County Title. And I think he is going to give us some ex invaluable insight because we are going to react, reenact scenarios and then we're going to bring Larry in to really comment on what has happened. And I, and I really think it's going to be an amazing show. So stay tuned to Real Estate Today. We'll be right back. In this reenactment, we'll see what tax consequences and problems a foreign investor will face when they try to sell property in the U.S. You know, this is such an amazing house. I can't believe you had aggravation selling it. Uh, yes, I uh, bought this house about five years ago. Right. And um, I'm trying to sell it now. I went to the closing table and I was told that they had to hold 10% of my purchase, of my selling price. And I know you made, you know, on paper you were going to make a really good profit, so it yes. must have been really upsetting. What, they, you told me they called you like a foreign investor? Yes, that because I did not obtain a tax ID number. I'm from Colombia, right. not from here. I really bought this as an investment right. and um, I didn't know that I had to get a tax ID number right. or a social security number uh, before I sold it and uh, so now they're telling me that I have to that they have to hold 10 percent of my of the purchase price so it's really not the same yes yeah, so I know you told me that you walked away from the deal so now we're in a different market and trying to sell the house and getting the same profit I, I know you're carrying the house is you know, it's a bad situation. That's correct. So, so I mean, obviously, you probably, uh, at a minimum, should have at least consulted an attorney had you known this issue. If the real estate broker had told me that I should have seen an attorney first. Right, right. Yes. Okay. All right, well, let's, uh, we'll see what Larry Fetter has to say, and, uh, you know, we'll talk to him and see if we can resolve this. Thank you. Okay, great. Larry, in Angela's situation, she obviously didn't realize that there were ramifications, you know, given the fact that she was a foreign investor and, She's from Colombia, she mm -hmm. doesn't have a social security number, and you know, even though she made a nice, or potentially made a nice profit on, on that investment property she purchased, it really didn't go through for the reasons I'd like you to explain to everyone at home. Okay, let me give you a little bit of background so you can understand what, why the problem comes up. Back in the early 80s, the Congress passed the FERPT Act. What that, what that, the purpose of the act was to prevent money laundering. Would, uh, the Congress wanted to make sure people couldn't get money from racketeering, money laundering, or any other criminal venture, buy property, sell it, and then I pay taxes on it. So they passed the FERPTA law. And that law basically says if you're a foreign investor and you sell a piece of property, and if you don't get a US ID number, we will hold back 10% of the gross price until you get the number or file your return. That way they put the onus on settlement agents okay. to collect that money and send it in. Now, let's take Angela's situation. What she should have done is before the closing, she had some lead time before she knew what was going to happen, go to an account and fill out the proper forms that would have shown A, what she bought it for, all her deductions such as real estate taxes, broker's fees, legal fees, repair fees, and that way she would have minimized her profit and then paid, a profit, paid the tax on that profit versus the full 10% hit when she sold. Right. Yeah, you know, the, uh, the truth is, I think this whole situation could have been avoided either A, had she hadn't gotten the advice of an attorney, or B, whatever real estate broker she worked with should have been versed in the fact that she was foreign or at least had a, a, you know, had asked that question. It's really only come to light in South Florida in recent years sure. because of the migration of people from the Soviet Union, from South America, and these are the problems, where obviously, people who have these problems because they are foreigners. They don't know to get a US ID number. Um, another possible way to resolve it is by using what's called a 1031 exchange, which means if she had found another piece of property, she could have used the proceeds from that, rolled it into that, and deferred all the taxes altogether. Right. So really, it's a question of knowing in advance, um, getting the, ta she could have gotten a tax ID number and resolve the problem. 
or done the return, gone to the closing, she would have got a certificate from the U.S. government saying, don't hold back money or send in this amount of money, and it might have resolved the problem. Now, she gets to the closing table. Is there a quick way to remedy it so she t shouldn't, you know, she, she lost the deal. Right. So was there a way to fix it? Quickly? Yeah. What I would have done is this. I would have explained to her that by law, if she hadn't done these things, filed the return, gotten the ID number, I would have held the 10% in escrow for a while. She would have had time then to go to the Uncle Sam to file the proper return and then gotten the tax return back, and I would have been instructed to withhold X amount of dollars, and she could have gotten the difference back to her. And that way it wouldn't have been a problem, but um, she could not escape the problem altogether. Uh, hopefully that situation won't happen again. And uh, let's see what happens in the next reenactment. And, okay. you know, I appreciate all your advice. Great. My pleasure. Stay with us. We'll be right back. In this next reenactment, we'll see why it's important for a buyer to have their contract reviewed by a lawyer before signing on the dotted line. Juanita, you told me that you're having a lot of aggravation with, I guess you bought a condo and they're trying to take your deposit. I mean, what is happening? Yes, um, here's my situation. I uh, signed a contract for a new condo. Mm -hmm. um, I put 10% down and I was recently denied uh, my financing, my mortgage right. application. Uh, so now the developer is telling me that they will keep uh, my deposit. Uh, further, I have not been able to sell the house that I currently own, right. um, so I'm, I'm really, I don't know what to do. Well, this is unfortunately in the kind of world we're dealing with right now, this is a very common situation, not a super common, but it's definitely happening. Mm -hmm. And do you remember if you had a mortgage contingency in that contract that you, you know, with the developer? I don't know. Yeah. I, I'm not So, because, you know, developer contracts are not boilerplate contracts. It's not like when we write a resale, we use standard contracts. It's called mm -hmm. a FAR bar or Florida bar contract. In your case, this is a developer written contract and without having really looked at it, I don't know how I can advise you. Mm -hmm. This is a perfect example why I always tell someone who's buying new construction, especially to have an attorney, you know, look at it. So, mm -hmm. you know, we probably should talk to Larry Fetter and get a good idea of, you know, what he what he thinks the best course of action is. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. You know, in Juanita's situation, Larry, I, I can't tell you how many times I see this when a buyer hasn't sold their house yet, has gone to contract, and probably she went to contract many months before, you know, the place was ready, because I think she bought a condo mm -hmm. and it was being built, signs a contract which she believes is a boilerplate contract, and as we know, being in the business, um, a lot of builders craft their contracts to be a little more, you know, a little one-sided toward the builder's side. And I always advise my clients to have an attorney review a builder's contract before um, signing it. Mm -hmm. So tell me, you know, how you would have handled this situation or what advice you would have given her. Well, you're right. Typically, the developer's contracts are very one-sided, skewed in favor of the developer, as opposed to the contract forms you use, the Florida bar form contracts, which really are more fair and equitable. So obviously, the first bit of advice is, Although you're fully in love with this piece of real estate and everyone tells you you might need a lawyer or not need a lawyer, it, it's, I can't tell you how important it is to have someone look to make sure you are protected. In Juanita's situation, I, if I remember correctly, she didn't have, she signed the contract, there was no contingency for getting her mortgage approval, there was no contingency for the sale of her house. And her problem was that she couldn't get her mortgage because she couldn't sell the house and the seller treated it like a cash deal and at that point, she's kind of out of luck, and she's subject to losing that deposit. Uh, yeah, the, uh, you know, I see this situation too many times, and, you know, the market has changed a little bit. And, you know, it's starting to get better. You know, mm -hmm. right now, it's, you know, in the middle of February, and, right. and, I, and I'm starting to see a lot more activity. But when a buyer gets in this kind of situation, is there anything they can do? I mean, have you negotiated things with the developer to see if there's some, uh, you know, uh, things that the buyer potentially can do to try and not lose their deposit? Well, you made a very good point. Market conditions. When things were booming a couple of years ago, developers wouldn't let you change a contract, wouldn't talk to you. You were just, once you signed, you meant nothing to them. Now, developers are dying to move their units. So even if you sign a contract that may give you some problems and headaches. Um, if you go back to them and tell them, listen, I want to buy the house, but I need an extension of time, or let me uh, go for another lender for a mortgage, they'll be more lean because they want to sell that unit. In Dade County alone, there's 77,000 brand new condominium units, which may, which may not be sold, but may not close. There's a glut on the market. 